Hello, and welcome to our webinar, The Power of Resilience in a Time of Uncertainty. Our speaker today is Professor Yossi Sheffi, Director of the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. I'm Martha Mangelsdorf, Editorial Director of MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator today. This webinar will be recorded and will be available to all attendees early next week. We welcome your questions for Professor Sheffi today. To submit questions, please enter them in the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Or you can submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag ResiliencePower. A continuing Twitter chat with Professor Sheffi will follow immediately after today's webinar under that same hashtag. Now let's begin. Professor Yossi Sheffi is the Alicia Gray II Professor of Engineering Systems at MIT, as well as the Director of the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. He is an expert in systems optimization, risk analysis, and supply chain management. Professor Sheffi is the author of several best-selling award-winning books, including The Resilient Enterprise. His newest book, the Power of Resilience, How the Best Companies Manage the Unexpected, will be published by MIT Press next month. Professor Sheffi, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Martha, and let's start. So we'll start with uh, thinking about what can go wrong. If you join this uh, webinar, you are probably worried already about what can go wrong, but let's talk about the last few years. So we had this eruption in this mountain that nobody can uh, pronounce that uh, halted aviation throughout Europe and had problems, caused some problems in uh, manufacturing and production for many companies. Uh, we had the Japanese tsunami and earthquake, of course, that was a major disaster. We had the Thailand floods that impacted particularly the uh, disk drive industry and created significant price increases. We had an explosion in a chemical plant in Germany of, the, of Evonik, and this almost halted production for the entire automotive industry when everybody found out that Evonik is responsible for over 50% of the world production of nylon 12, certain plastic that is used in automotive applications. We had also strikes. Uh, not only uh, in the United States. The example here is the uh, Los Angeles Long Beach port strike that uh, halted the movement of freight throughout the port, the largest port complex in the U.S. And we had the horse meat fiasco in uh, Europe where IKEA, for example, found that the iconic meatballs are actually horse meatballs. And several other providers also suffered from the same issue. One can think about all kinds of risks, and what I have here is a, a dichotomy of this uh, risk. One can think about random phenomena, mostly natural phenomena, earthquake, fires. One can think about accidents, about issues that have to do with government and politics and um, closing trade lanes. There are issues of non-compliance with all kinds of regulations that can shut a company down, in fact. There's the issue of competition. Competition can come from left field, from where nobody expects it. Certainly, Nokia didn't expect a computer company to uh, move it from the world leader in cell phone to an old Soren and then out of this business. The economy, of course, can provide surprises. We had the 2008, but before that, we had the uh, Asian currency debacle and, of course, 1930s. There are issues of corporate social responsibility, what I call social disconnect, when companies are getting caught doing things that impact their brand. Uh, but it can also happen because a supplier gets caught and NGOs and, and the media will usually attack the brand holder rather than the supplier. And of course, there are intentional disruptions. Those can be not only terrorist attack, but also strikes and uh, sabotage. These are kind of different from all others because they'll usually happen in the worst place and the worst time. So it is something to uh, to worry about, and it's hard to insure against because there is uh, 
several issues going on there. First of all, there's no pattern. And second, if somebody, if uh, there are two plants right next to each other and one plant, for example, fortifies its defenses, the, not only the consequences of an attack on this plant would be lower, the probability of attack will be lower, and the probability of, of attack on an adjacent plant will be higher, even though it didn't do anything. And of course, you can have all kinds of reasons for supplier failure that can be um, for any reason at all. So as we think about these things, uh, we can think about disruptions in terms of causes and in terms of effect. Causes are hurricane, earthquake, strikes, a coup. The effects are supplier down, a, a port is closed, whatever. And thinking about the causes helps to estimate the likelihood that this thing will happen. And thinking about the effect helps estimate the impacts and the consequences of such disruptions. So how do we categorize this type of, of disruption, all type of disruption? The classic way to categorize them is along two axes, the disruption probability and the consequences of the disruption. So the, the disruption probability means how likely is the disruption to take place, and the consequences mean if it hits, how bad is it going to be? And usually people put possible disruptions anywhere along this axis, and they help to prioritize which disruptions one should be prepared for. And typically, the um, people look at disruptions that uh, have high consequences and high probability as those that one should prioritize and be prepared for, because the, the metric that people use is the expected value, which means the probability of disruption times the consequences. And if this is the metric, then the items on the um, right-hand upper quadrant will be the most dangerous. If we look at how to classify them, clearly items on the lower left um, quadrant that have low probability and light consequences one should not worry about. Things that have high probability, they happen a lot, but the consequences are not too bad. These are the firefighting issues. These are the things that give uh, operations management and supply chain executives job security. Things are happening all the time, so one has to deal with it. The, on, on the right-hand upper qu uh, quadrant, these are the things that we mentioned before, the high expected value, while actually the most dangerous events are on the lower right-hand side. These are the things that have low probability and in many cases never happened before, but have high consequences. Think about 9-11, the BP explosion, Bhopal. Those type of huge disruptions that did not happen before means the companies are not prepared for them, don't know how to prepare for them. So actually, one has to classify disruption a little bit differently and I put the most worrisome on the low probability, severe consequences side. And you prepare for these things differently. To prepare for the high expected value disruptions, one can identify the risks. These are things that happened before. They are, if they are high probability, they happened before. And one prepares a response. For example, Cisco is known for having playbooks. So they have um, 14, 18, any number of playbooks. Each one of them is for a family of disruptions, and there's a general way of responding to it. So if one of these disruptions happens, there's a playbook that uh, helps the response. Companies can also drill and get their people exercise and get their respond, know who the respondents are, how they are organized, and how they should be responding. The, um, the lower right-hand side is where the black swans are. These are the things that did not happen before, or happen rarely, did not happen to your company, did not happen to a competitor. 
So you have to dream about them. You have to imagine them. You have to dream scenarios. And here the idea is to prepare general response. You don't, you cannot prepare a specific response because you don't know what these are going to be, but you prepare a general response. So you may want, for example, to put together an emergency response room, emergency response headquarters with the right uh, communication channels, knowing who are the people in the company that should be staff this type of uh, center. Things like this. So the idea is to develop general resilience regardless of what the, uh, uh, the event might be. Uh, these type of events, by the way, these uh, dangerous events, are usually characterized by public fear. Uh, think about 9-11. They are usually characterized by government overreaction because uh, in many cases the government has to be seen as doing something important and overreacts. They also it overreacts because there's very little knowledge, very little information about what's going on. Think about after 9-11, the, gov the U.S. government closed the borders. Most, or large part of the economic damage was caused not by the falling towers, but actually by closing the borders. Uh, many manufacturing companies, for example Ford, couldn't bring parts from Canada because the borders were closed. And of course, there's the issue of institutional incompetence. Uh, the example here is what happened during the BP disaster when Louisiana did not allow to build a berm that would hold off the oil from reaching the marshes because they needed permit, they needed environmental impact statement, so you couldn't build the berm because it takes a long time to do the environmental impact statement. Also, the U.S. did not allow foreign skimmers, even though the best skimmers are the Dutch and they offered to help, the U.S. out of... Uh, we can do it better, or who knows why, did not want for a skimmer. Later on, they did allow it towards the, uh, the end. Uh, it did not allow many private boats to participate because the Coast Guard decided they did not have enough life, life vest, so they didn't have enough capacity to fight all the oil. Um, in addition, there could be unexpected connections and consequences. I, I, early on when I did this research, I used to have lots of examples, but after 2008, it became clear how connected the world is. The fact that uh, people were getting mortgages that they cannot pay in the United States a few years later causes Europe and the Greek crisis. So we see how connected the world is. Uh, finally, it's not very unlikely while one can think that the probability of a certain event in a particular time to a particular company is very, very small, the probability that something will happen somewhere for a large multinational is not small at all. Let's move on and change the subject and to how we characterize, continue actually, how we characterize disruptions and here I want to add another axis to the probability and consequences framework, and this is the detectability axis. They can be long-term and short-term uh, detectability. Detectability is the time from when you know that something will happen until it hits. So this is how long it takes from sensing that something is going to happen to impact. It can be short-term, it can be long-term, and it can be negative. What does it mean negative? It means you find out only two years later, or you don't find out at all that something happened. This is the whole idea of, for example, cyber attack or some pathogen that's uh, distributed in the population. There are lots of things that can happen and you don't know about them until it's too late, or you never find out about them. So there are these are some examples of these uh, things that happen along uh, things that happen along the detectability axis. So it could be things that happen you find out after the fact, whether it's industrial espionage, some pathogen, cyber agent. It could be things that are immediate. You have uh, the missile is coming if you live in Israel next to the Gaza Strip, and you you will have 30, 40, 50 seconds before the missile hits. Once you get uh, the alarm that the missile is coming. Tsunami sensors are also something that can give you from a few seconds 
to a few hours of um, warnings. There was a case in, uh, uh, in Mexico when there was a tsunami in the Pacific, and by the time the wave traveled through the ocean and to the ground to Mexico City, Mexico City was able to shut down the Mexico City subway about 40 seconds before the tsunami hit Mexico City. So you can do these things. You can shut down the subway, you can stop elevators, you can uh, uh, stop industrial process that may be damaged during a, an earthquake. The, of course, the short term, talking about one, two, three days, is the weather forecast, you see that hurricane is coming, you can see the hurricane cone and get an idea where it's going. There are medium term, you see deteriorating labor relationship or some competition develop. And there are some long term things, whether it's aging or global warming or deteriorating infrastructure. You can see this coming, they'll take years. And here the issue is, the danger is, of course, with the negative detectability or short term, with the long term there's opportunity because you see this uh, type of uh, trends and you can prepare for them and a company that will prepare better than its competitor will have an advantage, obviously. Lately, uh, risk management and resilience became a topic that is has been rising to the top of many uh, CA, you know, corporate officers and boardrooms. And this is an example of some of the many software tools that are being developed either by large companies or by startups in order to alert companies that something is happening. All this, all this uh, software system are based on uh, event alert systems like NC4, uh, Maryland, Enera. All these are give you events all over the world, from fire somewhere to, uh, to demonstration, to strikes, uh, to earthquake, what have you. Many of these companies, like uh, Resilink, for example, um, what they do is they get data on where the company's facility are and which supplier is making what, and very quickly, within seconds, once they have the alert from NC4, for example, they can give the company information about which products will be affected and, in fact, wh how, what is the value at risk. So these are very useful for prioritization and quick response. Let's now go to some examples. And the first example is the Procter & Gamble response to uh, Katerina. So, Procter & Gamble has facility in uh, Gentilly, which is right around, right uh, in New Orleans. Half of the P&G coffee production, 20% of the U.S. is there, and also has some other uh, distribution center there. August 25th, um, P&G saw that uh, things don't look good. This was several days early, but he said this might be bad. They moved product out of the region, they got backup takes, they're preparing for a, prepare for a possible shutdown. On August 27, two days later, the storm started turning north. They shut down the site, they told all the employees to evacuate. On August 29, Katerina hit New Orleans. At this point, P&G started uh, two priorities, supporting employees and restoring plants. By the way, these are things that they... Uh, Several companies, notably Intel, has totally separated to make sure that employee support and uh, restoring the, pl the plant or restoring the business do not interfere with each other, and neither one of them gets priority over the other. Um, the P&G set up a command center and staging area in Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge, right outside uh, uh, New Orleans. They had to take some photos from the air because nobody knows what was going on. They found out that the plant had limited damage, but a lot of the infrastructure around it was really down. They immediately went on to start finding the employees. They offer continuity of pay. They offer counseling to, um, to employees. And they went at the same time to start restoring the plant. They needed alternative source of supply because the plant is down, they had to bring uh, stuff from other places. They needed housing and they built a trailer village with 125 trailers. 
they had to dig a new well because it's very large amounts of water. And they had very good relationship with the local police that helped them a lot because going through all the roadblocks, they had police escort, and otherwise they would have spent hours and hours every time they had to bring a convoy to the uh, plant with supplies. So here the, um, the moral of the story is that local relationships are very important. As I just know, the plant started production September 17th. It was the first production in New Orleans. President Bush came down. It was a big ceremony, but they got back on their feet very quickly. Let's look at another example and try to get some learnings out of that. This one is General Motors and the disaster in Japan. And these are the suppliers that General Motors had in Japan. So you see that they're all around the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, right in the epicenter of the, um, of the earthquake and the tsunami. Around it, you see the concerning circles that show the distance of the various suppliers from the um, epicenter of the disaster. Most of the suppliers were within the radioactive zone. Uh, originally, when the information got to GM early on uh, on uh, March 14, the estimate was that 30 suppliers are down, 390 parts are affected. At this point, nobody got excited until they did some calculation. They said, okay, the first plant that will not have parts for production will be about eight days later, March 22nd. And by the way, by the end of the month, GM, all of GM would be down. At that point, alarm bells rang throughout GM, and it was a reason to start taking it seriously. GM organized relatively quickly. They created a crisis suit to, to co coordinate centrally the response. They had supply chain people and engineering people in the uh, suit. They had also smaller crisis room in international location. The most important thing, they knew immediately who to call based on what's called Project D. That's where Delphi, several years before that, went out of business. They were the biggest supplier of GM and they went bankrupt. So in order to deal with that type of emergency, they created this uh, team and they knew who to call. The leader of the team was Bob Hurls, who was the executive director of global supply chain at uh, General Motors. Uh, this is what the one, it was actually three rooms, this is what one of the rooms in GM headquarters looked like, and on the lower right-hand side is uh, Bob Hurls, who was running the operation. This was the daily cycle. Uh, at 6 o'clock there was update of uh, senior management, then they had sub-team meetings, all the functional meetings. Then information was rolling down to all other teams. 10.30, there was an update of the sales, service, and marketing because you needed to update the dealers, to update customers. And at the end of the day, at 4 o'clock, was follow-up and new information that uh, came out uh, during the day. The center was running, by the way, 24-7, and people were there basically 24-7. Uh, what happened is, let's look at how the events unfold. So, March 11, we had the earthquake and the tsunami. Um, at that point, they, they thought that less than 25 or 30 part, tier 1 suppliers are being uh, um, impacted by the um, problem. On uh, March 14th, they formed the, the risk mitigation team. At that point, they knew that 390 part numbers are missing. March 24, the, they knew that 1,500, more than 1,500 white parts are missing, and they formed the white space chart, which I'll show you in a minute. That's a way to track what was going on. March 29, um, almost 2,000 parts are missing. April 13, over 5,000 parts are missing. 
May 27, almost 6,000 parts were missing. They divide, at the end there were so many parts missing that they could not really follow them, so they divide them into families, what they call commodities. You can think about them as sub-assemblies. But uh, they were tracking these 118 commodities. And the way they're being tracked is on this, what is called, white space chart. What you see on the left-hand side, 1 to 16, are GM assembly plants. They are code names that I will not uh, explain here. What you see on the top are dates. And actually, the team worked from left and right, but the X's, the O's, and the triangles mean that the X mean there's a platform production reduction. Either they cannot build anymore or they can build only a limited number. The triangle mean uh, there's a potential issue, but they are working through it and they think they have a solution. Uh, the uh, uh, circle mean that uh, they have a problem, but they have already a solution for it. So what happens is people were working both from left and, and from the right. Uh, this was the first type of uh, um, white space chart. And the way it worked, if you look at it now, is the following. The supply chain and uh, logistics people were working left to right. They were trying to find inventories deep in the supply chain. They were trying to find uh, inventories that were uh, on the seas. The people on the right were the engineering people. The engineering people were working to find uh, different alternative parts and different alternative suppliers and thinking about how fast they can qualify them. So the, the time between them is the white space. So green means that we're in production. And the white space is the time that plants will have to be down. The black marks in the middle of the table are the summer close down when GM closed down the plant anyway for model year changes. So this is how they work from the right and from the left and trying to close this white, sta in the white space. So supply chain looked at inventory anywhere and as you could see from what I showed you before, when the number of parts went from 390 to almost 6,000, the problem is that more and more people are finding out that deeper and deeper in the supply chain, they had problems. Because the supply chain of GM is so deep, it took a while to realize that they have a problem with certain parts. Somebody at tier 4, 5, or 6 was, could, not, could not produce something and then their customer could not produce, and their customer could not produce. Finally, it was getting to GM. So it took a while, but the, the depth of this supply chain means that if somebody at Tier 6 could not produce something, most likely there was inventory at Tier 5, 4, 3, 2, and so forth. So this is what the supply chain people did. Look for inventory anywhere. Engineering look at different parts, and then procurement and engineering were working together to find and qualify alternate suppliers. Of course, logistics had to get the new part in from a different supplier or uh, a different location. Finally, there was one case when they had to do allocation. This is something that companies have to always prepare ahead of time. Uh, in GM case, they had to stop the production of the... Um, Shreveport, Colorado truck plant for one week because they didn't have enough engine controller, airflow sensor, and brake control modules. Now, turns out that these parts can go either on big trucks or small trucks. Small trucks don't have a large profit. Big trucks have a huge profit. On top of it, they did not have a lot of uh, dealer stock of the big trucks, but had a lot of dealer stock of the small trucks, so they decided to stop production of the small trucks. People made a big deal out of it. turned out it was a serious decision, very controlled decision, and as it turns out, they didn't even have to make it. Once After they made the decision, they found out that they have enough uh, inventory for everything. So this is what the uh, white space chart looked the, towards the end of the period. And you see that GM was able to build through the entire period. Important lesson learned is who to call, 
who is who has the expertise, the commitment, knows the supply chain, who has the good relationship with the supplier. Of course, very important, the leadership will be engaged and visible and, and committed throughout. One example that's uh, very important to learn from GM is that uh, everybody has to stick to the job. One example is the uh, heat, the, uh, they had no heating modules for seats. Now, so somebody said, let's not build uh, automobile with heated seats. The problem is heated seats go with leather, so you build more cloth seats, and it affects the cloth and leather mix, which affect the basic and luxury uh, models. And canceling the leather seats means that all subassembly and components that went into the seats become stranded somewhere, and you have you don't have enough cloth seats. On top of it, dealers and consumer what the what want what they want, and GM is trying to give them what they want. So the mantra after that was stay in your swim lane. Don't go and try to do somebody as a job because you can create more problems by trying to solve one issue. Uh, some words about preparation. Uh, we talked about detection a little bit, but uh, for example, the Center for, for Disease Control takes a sample of hospital admissions from the U.S. every morning in order, and does statistical process control in order to see if there's some concentration or some trends in terms of certain diseases because everybody is afraid of some pathogen that uh, can infect large parts of the population. And I'm not going to talk much about security beyond just mentioning it. It's a, uh, the issue of layering. You want, you know, when you go into a car accident, you have the uh, energy absorbing parts of the engine. You have the the, um, the steering wheel uh, breaks down. You have the the belt. You have the uh, uh, lots of things between you and, uh, and getting hurt. Balancing means that you want, want to defend the front door and the back door. Uh, profiling means that you want simply to to put efforts where the danger is, rather than according to um, political considerations, for example. I'm not going to spend much time on this. Let's move on. Um, the basic ways to create resiliency, there are two ways, redundancy and flexibility. An example of redundancy, I have many examples. I'm not going to go to all of them. But, for example, during the anthrax attack, the U.S. Postal Service was able to continue operating with no problem, even though it had to close some of these biggest facilities. And the reason was that uh, there was overcapacity in the system. From years of uh, first fax, then email, then paying bills online, the volume of mail that the U.S. Postal Service is, uh, is handling getting smaller and smaller, yet the system did not contract accordingly, so they had a lot of extra capacity uh, in the system. But, of course... For commercial company, it's very hard to keep extra capacity or extra inventory or anything of redundant anything that uh, include redundancy is simply too expensive to keep, and companies be become not competitive. So instead of this, companies want to develop flexibility. For example, Intel plants are basically interchangeable; they are all built the same. It's called um, Intel Exact. They, the, the plans are built exactly the same way anywhere around the world, which means, for example, that during the SARS epidemic, they were able to move production around relatively uh, easily. Also, the uh, Intel standardized many of these parts, so even though some of them may be over-engineered, they can uh, use the same part in different uh, in different products, regardless of how these products are selling. Uh, another example is product standardization. Southwest Airlines, for example, is using only 737, and so every pilot can walk into every cockpit and, and fly it because they're always disrupted due to weather, due to lateness, whatever. And there's always disrupt. Of course, it creates a problem if something fundamentally happens to the 737. There's a flow in the 737, but this is the plane that have the most number of planes around the world are 737, so it's a very small. Uh, risk. And if you think about standardization, think about the difference between the Mercedes e clans which you can order in one out of 3.9 trillion combinations, and compare it to the uh, Honda Accord, which is available only in 529 combination. This, by the way, includes engine type and color and whatever. Uh, 
think about how much easier it is to do a recall on the Honda Accord versus the uh, the Mercedes E-Class, and why the quality of the Honda Accord is so much higher. You can think about the cross-training people, and I have uh, several examples from UPS that can move people around in case in case of a disaster. And you can think about postponement when, for example, uh, Hewlett Packard does a uh, um, customization of its uh, uh, printers in Holland rather than send printers with every language to every country. Finally, the question is how to, what I call, make lemonade from lemon. Preparing for resilience is expensive, and it's like buying insurance, basically. So, But here you can use security measures. When you map the process in order to find out the weak link, you can use it for process tightening, and, of course, if you are more flexible than your competitor, you can um, look at disruptions as opportunities, opportunities to f increase market share, but also to fix long-standing problems in your own company. Finally, a word of caution. This is the quote from Donald Rumsfeld, the famous quote, that there are known knowns. These are things that we know that we know. There are known unknowns. These are, this is to say there are things that we know we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. These are the things we don't know we don't know. These are the things that uh, Nassim Taleb was calling the black swans. few more uh, points. First of all, note that uh, a lot of what we do in terms of forecasting is based on statistical reasoning, and this is based on history. History is not likely to repeat itself. The biggest... Uh, the biggest event will always be in the future. Think about it. History is bounded. The future is not bounded. That's why world records are being broken. So the biggest event that will ever happen did not happen yet. Always will happen in the future. And the imagination is bounded by the largest past event. Well, the future event is likely to be bigger. And the complexity of the modern world increases the chance of unknown unknown because there are so many interactions between various parts of the system that one can get unexpected results. Uh, evolutionary principle may help deal with complexity. Uh, learning from small staff, allowing for failure, will socialize the organization to deal with, uh, with, with complexity and with disruptions. Finally, let me just say that lack of evidence of disruption does not mean that it's evidence of lack of disruption. This is particularly important when you talk about the negative detectability issue. The fact that you don't know that you had something doesn't mean that you did not have it. Let me stop here. I think we got to the end of our time, and I think I'll open it for questions. Thank you, Yossi. That was a wonderful presentation. We'll now move on to our Q&A. We've gotten lots of great questions, and we'll continue to take your questions for the remainder of the hour, as well as via Twitter. Just a reminder that you can submit your questions by entering them into the chat box in the lower left corner of the webinar screen, or on Twitter using the hashtag ResiliencePower. And now we'll turn to the questions. How, Yossi, how is a disruption different from a crisis or disaster? Uh, it is it is semantics. Uh, a disruption creates a crisis, so it can create a crisis if you are not prepared. So the fact that there was a, a, an Arab Spring, it could be for some companies it was a crisis. Some companies were prepared to move um, production and services around. It was not. So I think this is only uh, semantics. I'm not sure that there's a Big difference. Different companies are using the same the same words to mean somewhat different things, but they kind of all mean bad things happening. And how is the company responding to these bad things happening? Got it. Okay. Another question uh, from the audience: What? Are, how do you overcome the challenges of preparing for disruptions when the c company culture doesn't want to handle bad news? Very good question, and a question that I uh, always get, and it's uh, frustrating to me, of course, because the company will companies will prepare once something happened to them, or sometimes to their um, even competitors. 
they can see that things can go wrong uh, and, and they'll prepare. Clearly, in my first book called The Resilient Enterprise, I devoted the whole first chapter to uh, the case of Ericsson uh, that had to get out of business of selling cell phones because of a fire in a Philips plant in, uh, in the United States, in um, New Mexico. Ericsson, after that, became a model of uh, risk preparation and resilience, and started investing in it, investing in sensing. And, but the question is, why does it have to happen only after something bad happens? This is a very difficult question. It is usually, I, I, I have uh, many occasions to speak to boards, and this is my number one lesson to the boards. Because in companies that are not thinking about it, and I should say, the difference between 10 years ago and today are many, many more companies are thinking about it, are taking it seriously, are making preparations. But uh, uh, the guy who asked the question, or the girl who asked the question, is absolutely right. In many companies, there's, uh, you don't want to hear about it. It even gets worse. It's not only don't we want to hear about it. The tenure of uh, average CEO is three years, four years. This is just investing money, and if nothing happens, then it's just cost. There's no benefit. It's just like you know, buying more insurance. So even though it's better than insurance, there are lots of positive things that you can get from preparation for resilience. Insurance is just money out. Um, still, companies don't want to invest because think about the CEO. They said, well, the chances will happen in the next three years are, are not very high. And meanwhile, to get my uh, bonus and my... Uh, you know, performance rewards, I don't want to increase costs. So it's, it's, sometimes it's dead, sometimes it just, as, a, as, the, as, the, guy, as the person who asked the question mentioned, nobody likes to talk about bad things that happen. We always like to talk about the great progress that we are making and what can happen until something bad happens. So I don't have a silver bullet here. Uh, it's in, in companies like this, it's a board issue, and the board has to make sure it is the fiduciary responsibility of the board to make sure that this is uh, paid attention to. Great. Thanks, Yossi. Another question. Each mitigation effort requires additional resources. How do you plan mitigation efforts if resources are limited? How do you allocate them optimally to minimize risk up front? Thank you for the question. This is where a lot of the uh, prioritization maps that I put up are coming into play. The idea is, first of all, to get a, to imagine everything that can go wrong. So once you imagine everything that can go wrong, let's think about things that happened before, not things that didn't happen before. We'll talk about that in a minute. But once you imagine everything that can go wrong, of course you cannot imagine everything. And by the way, not every response requires the same type of resources. If you have something like uh, workplace violence, it can be a, a simpler thing than a plant burn down. So the, one has to also think about not only the, uh, the damage or the crisis, but how much it takes to mitigate it, and then make a list of, at, at this point, the list can be based on expected value. So how likely it is to happen, and how likely it is to happen. You can look at the, uh, at the literature. You can look at the, the history of your own company if you've been in business for a while. When do things happen? How, how big they were? What's the probability? And what was the damage? Then you say, okay, this is the probability, and this is how much the, uh, uh, the damage was. How much does it cost to mitigate it? And sometimes, even though it's high probability and high, uh, high consequences, the mitigation cost may be too high. So you said, we'll take a chance. Uh, so it, it's a question of what are the mitigation costs. In addition to this, in parallel, you want to think about generally performing general resilience. This, by the way, may be if the, if the resources are really, really limited, I would recommend doing that, meaning make sure that you know who to call, that there's one place in the company with enough communication line going in that uh, you can, and it's better be off-site, 
that you can communicate and have the computing power and have the electricity to communicate with the rest of the company and with the world, that you know who should go a priori into a center like this. And these are the people who are familiar with the company. It is not the CEO. It is the people who are familiar with the day-to-day -day operation. But, but you also want communication people because they want to keep Wall Street. They want to keep investors. They want to keep all stakeholders informed. And this information goes to the CEO because the CEO is the face of the company. But you need to keep them informed so they don't actually interfere with what the, uh, the people who know the supply chain, who know the manufacturing, who know the real estate, who know the trade lanes should be doing day in and day out. But so I, I, as I said, if resources are very limited, I suggest starting with general resilience and then, but at the same time, hitting the, uh, the preparation in terms of everything that can go wrong and just trying to get a handle of it and see what it is that you are prefer, prepared for, what is the company is not prepared for, what can be prepared for relatively um, inexpensively. By the way, just uh, to make a point, in most companies that I know, the people who man the crisis management center are not full-time crisis manager employees. They are engineers, they are supply chain people, they are uh, marketing people who are simply called upon to do it in case of a crisis. They have both deep knowledge of their uh, functions, but they have also wide knowledge of the company. They have probably many years with the company. They care about the company, and they are willing to work 24-7 and help the company at this stage. Great. Thanks, Yossi. Another question. Do you have any benchmarks for corporate spending on business continuity preparation? Okay. This is uh, something that is no. The, answer, the, the short answer is unfortunately no. Companies, by and large, are not uh, open with this. So I, I, can, I can give you instead companies to talk to. And <laughs> you want to some of the gold standards in, in in preparation would be Intel, would be Cisco, companies that invest quite a bit in it and are simply very good at it. And it's not in this case the you know the culture of the company is to look for things that can go wrong, not just to celebrate successes and sales, but look always at the back of the mind for things that can go wrong. So it's beyond even the, in, the, the straightforward investments in the uh, preparation, but it's the corporate culture that uh, gets to be alert, as the, um, one of the last CEO of Intel said, uh, only the paranoid survive. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. This is the culture. Great. Okay. Uh, another question from the audience. Looking at GM's example, would it be fair to say that geographical concentration of suppliers has disadvantages too, and hence a business case exists for having suppliers from different parts of the world? Obviously, this might have some consequences for costs, but the advantage could be prevention as opposed to crisis management. What are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, GM does not only have supply in Japan. They're so big, there are suppliers everywhere. Uh, Japan, of course, is an important uh, uh, important supply base. But let me talk in general. Uh, there's so many things that can I can talk about here. But let me talk about about the following. Concentration of supplier. If you think about concentration of supplier, it's uh, not only important not to have concentration of your supplier in one place. You don't want to be next to many other suppliers. So you want to have limited presence in so-called suppliers clusters. For example, if you buy memory chip from any place in northern Taiwan, please note that everybody else does it. It's 70% of the world uh, supply of certain chips. If something, if an earthquake happened in northern Taiwan, the problem is not only that you would not have anything, you will not have alternate suppliers. So it's a you think not only about your concentration, but concentration in general. That's one thing. And I'll give you the countervailing argument, another counter argument. There are two types of risk. 
the first week is supplier going down and for this you want alternate suppliers you want more than one supplier and hopefully not next door but the more suppliers you have the more danger you have from corporate social responsibility point of view because from corporate social responsibility point of view it's enough that one of your supplier and you may have tens of thousands it's enough that one supplier is found out to have sweatshops or be in a building that falls falls down in a, um, in Banda Aceh or in a, you know anywhere in the third world or having some a river being polluted by one of your suppliers that supplier in the depths of China will not be attacked your company will be attacked the brand owner will always be attacked because NGOs and the media know that they have no sway over supplier in the depths of China, Vietnam, or Africa, or Latin America, but they can attack your company, and they can make sure that the brand will be uh, diminished, and some customers, some especially consumers, will think twice before buying from your company. Just to remind everybody, when a supplier was a second-tier supplier of Nike several years ago, was on the front uh, front page of Time magazine demonstrating that they are sewing soccer balls for nine cents a day, Nike sales plunge about 30 or 40 percent. So this can be serious. And by the way, Nike was sure they're doing the right thing. They brought jobs for people who didn't have jobs before and brought employment and all this. So this is, as you increase the number of suppliers, the danger increases because it's enough that one of them will go, will do something bad and your company will be attacked. On the other hand, you're right. You don't want to be, to have all your supplier in, in one place, but it's always a trade-off, you know, because if, you're, if your supplier is, uh, let's say you decide to have one supplier. So first of all, you have to watch the supplier like a hawk. It's part of your company. You have to audit them. You have to talk to them. You have to understand the strategy. You have to understand their supplier. In addition to this, you want maybe to ensure that they are not close to other suppliers of the same thing because you don't want to be in a cluster where something happens, the whole, the whole supply base goes down, and you would not find an alternate supplier. Anyway, sorry for a long answer for a short and very good question. Yeah, it's a good answer. Okay, another good question from the audience. What space exists for collaboration and negotiation in a resilience framework? You're describing ingenious moves that benefited one party over competitors. But in a real crisis, won't smart leaders need to support the whole ecosystem? Absolutely. And, of course, the, uh, the emphasis was on smart leaders. Um, I, I gave the example of the Evonik... Uh, explosion and fire in the plant. It was a German chemical plant that made the, this nylon 12 type of plastic that is used. It's very, you know, hard plastic and, and can can withstand corrosion and high temperature, whatever. Very useful for automotive application as well as many others. Since it has such an effect on the automotive industry, the whole automotive industry got together under the um, the umbrella of the Automotive Industry Action Group, the AIG, in Detroit, and this was German German automobile manufacturers, Japanese automobile manufacturers, American automobile manufacturers, Korean. They all got together with many suppliers and with many chemical companies. That Dow, for example, that never made uh, nylon 12, was able within a few days to rejig its operation to make some uh, some nylon 12. Of course, Evonik itself, engineers were there. So. Of course, this is an example where working together was very helpful. Another example is during the 2008 crisis when uh, Alan Mulally, the CEO of Ford, came to, the, came to Congress and requested and pleaded with, con with Congress to save GM and Chrysler. He explained that if GM and Chrysler would go out of business, the supplier the whole supply chain that supplied to GM, Ford, and Chrysler, as well as many others, would go down. They would not be able to survive just on Ford business alone. So he pleaded with Congress to save his competitors. Again, an example of what the, um, the person who asked the question, I think, alluded to. Absolutely, smart leaders understand that if the crisis is big enough, 
saving their own company is not the issue, but they have to worry about saving the industry. Great. Here's another question from the audience. As an example of the low probability, severe consequences type of event, please consider the disappearance of the Malaysian airline aircraft over the Indian Ocean. <laughs> Only yeah. now have some pieces of the aircraft been found in Reunion Island. What could be the general response in this type of event? There has been a lot of trauma for the affected families. And what can be done to be resilient when something like this happens? Actually... In my new book, The Power of Resilience, I use this example because, the, I, well, I did not know the book is already, already in production, so I didn't know they'll find the, uh, uh, the part from the, uh, from the wing, but uh, I actually analyze in detail the response of the Malaysian government as an example of how not to do something because uh, at this point, very little that they can do in terms of mitigating the consequences. It happened. Uh, it was clear to any professionals that the airplane was lost. The question is how now you communicate to the family, to the world. And this is such a case of confused communications that people were, you know, statements were coming from the prime minister, from the head of the air force, from all the agencies involved, in many cases contradicting, this was a bad case of how to communicate to the world, and it actually increased the heartache for the families because nobody knows what's going on. The worst thing in disaster is lack of information or inaccurate information. The best thing that one can hope for in a disaster like this is give the most accurate information possible and if you have to give information when you don't know all the details, you have to tell people that this, you don't know all the details, but this is the best you know, and it may change. Be upfront and accurate. That's the only thing that can be done, and speak with one voice. So this was an example in the first month following the, uh, uh, the disappearance of MH370, that where things did not go the way one would wish them to go. Thanks. Another question from the audience. Dear Professor Sheffy, thank you for your presentation. I have read your book, The Resilient Enterprise, and several articles. I also have read the work by your colleagues, Dr. Pettit and Dr. Fixel. My question is, what differs, what, how do resilient supply chains differ from an agile supply chain? Are they the same? Okay. The, uh, the reference to agile supply chain, people use uh, interchangeably agile and, and flexible, and you can... I don't want to uh, to separate uh, between them. Resilience is responding to anything. So you can respond by having redundancy. You do not need to have agility or flexibility. It's one way to respond. But having redundancy, for example, you keep safety stock. Safety stock is not an agility element. It's a redundancy element. You have redundant stock, and it helps. It helps you to um, to catch your breath if something is happening so you can prepare. Uh, if you have, there are many other examples of uh, redundancies that make sense. Agility and flexibility are simply the ability to respond quickly and move from one situation to another. So it's one way of responding. Uh, it's, a, it's a good way when you can build it in. It also, by the way, costs money to be able to be uh, flexible. Usually it does not come cheap, but it's worth doing because flexibility and agility, and I use them interchangeably, also allows you to respond not only to disasters, but they allow you to respond to changes in the marketplace, to changes in demand. Demand for one product goes down, demand for one product goes up. You can move from one to the other very quickly. So agility and flexibility give you other uh, pluses beyond the uh, insurance type that the redundancy gives you. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Now I'm going to ask you the question that I think is the most popular question. Uh, many attendees are asking, um, will it be possible uh, f for them to get a copy of your slides? Would you be willing to distribute those, after, to have us distribute those to attendees? Well, given my uh, deal with MIT Press, I will be able to do it in September when the books come okay. out. <laughs> okay. So uh, I, I don't pre-give them, but... I can I can redact them and give most of them. Yes. Okay. I, I, I can do it. 
Okay, terrific. Excellent. Um, that concludes uh, the presentation, uh, th- this portion of our program. You can continue the conversation with us on Twitter at the hashtag ResiliencePower. A reminder that a recording of this program will be available early next week. Thank you all for attending our program today, and thank you to the sponsor of today's event, UPS. Thanks very much. <laughs>